Folks, welcome back to So Bad It's Good, presented by Betches Media. Um, I watched something over the weekend that was just truly stunning. I was in it for the entire four episodes of this new docu-series on HBO. It contains everything that we love, taking us into a world that many don't know about. We got religion, potential cult or cult-like following, deceit, lies, and mystery. This film is an exploration of LA-based millennial guru Jagat, aka Katie Griggs, and her multi-million dollar business as a yoga guru to the stars. Her clients included like Madonna, Kate Hudson, Alicia Keys, Orlando Bloom, and she was also the face of Kun Kundalini Yoga Practice and the founder of the Rama Institute. And this film follows her meteoric rise to fame and her stunning fall from grace that exposed this multi-billion dollar spiritual empire that was just fraught with abuse. Um, we have the directors of this docuseries on today, Haley Pappas and Smiley Stevens. Welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having us. I mean, First off, congratulations. This is truly like a stunning piece of work that I, there were so many as, uh, uh, aspects of this. I had no clue about how do you even begin to tell this story? Did you know it was going to be four parts from the beginning? No, I think we played around with a few different iterations and thank you so much for the kind words. Um, yeah, you know, I think we, we entered into the story sort of knowing that we wanted to explore all of these themes, I think it ballooned and expanded. And, and the more sources we spoke to, the larger it became. Um, we knew from the beginning there was going to be sort of like a rich archival trove of, of visuals and footage that was stunning. And then I think, you know, one of the sort of challenges and, and fun elements was was incorporating all of that sort of 60s footage with with the media of today, all the, the sort of social media presence and and iteration of the practice today. But um, no, we didn't initially know it would be four parts. I think, frankly, we probably could have I, gone longer. I, know. I was like, is there going to be a second season of this? Even though I think it's, you know, it pretty much <laughs> ends. But Katie is the entrance point because then we get to learn about Yogi Bhajan and Harry Jiwin and all of these other characters. And I was not familiar with Yogi Bhajan, who is kind of uh, brought Kundalini yoga over to us and started this this form or type of yoga. And this man, I mean, I, I don't want to call it a character because I think there were so many sinister things about him, but we see this so many times in stories like this where there is such an abuse of power and it started with this man and then traveled <laughs> to Katie and Harry Gwynn and things like that. Yeah, I think also that, I mean, going back to kind of the first question, that's that was our intro to this story was actually through Yogi Bhajan. Um, one of a, a friend of mine had been raised in in uh, 3HO in New Mexico. And so that's how we first got turned on to this story. And then as we were digging in more, um, we didn't even really know about Guru Jagat at, in the first stages of our development of the show. And then uh, we found out about her kind of, you know, er early on, but she wasn't the first person we we had thought of to make a show about this. And then she was just so fascinating that that's kind of how we uh, steered it in that direction. That's a, that's really interesting because I thought it was like, oh, the Vanity Fair article had come out. Yeah, but you guys already yeah. were on, on budget. That's wild. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, so it's actually interesting. We had started sort of reporting and and speaking to various individuals and starting to sort of dig into this world. And we were actually put in touch via one of our characters, one of the individuals we were talking to was also talking to Vanity Fair as they were reporting their story. Um, so it actually came about in a really organic way. And we decided to team up with Vanity Fair and their reporting sort of opened the door to you know these various different dimensions and elements of the practice and new characters um and it wound up being really complimentary the way that we were able to work together um but yeah i think to your other point yogi bhajan is archetypal in a lot of ways of these very sort of stereotypical cult leaders and of these types of organizations um and that looks like and i think what made it particularly interesting was Guru Jagat's sort of presence and her, um, you know, her adaptation of that, the way that sort of she repackaged and repurposed it all in this like millennial pink feminist or an Instagram branding. or an Instagram yeah. way. Like you almost yeah. went, like, you almost were like, oh, if she was still around, I would be like so interested to see what she would do with TikTok, you know? Oh. 
Oh, oh, she's got the money guns on TikTok. <laughs> I, I mean, she had a great TikTok. I hate to, sorry, I hate yeah. to laugh about something so serious, but there's footage of her coming out with these money guns, and you even make the point of how much money she was spending. It was always these jewels she was purchasing, and then it's so sad to see where she ended. It was like penniless, and obviously just did not take care of her health, as well as Yogi Bhajan was the same way. And I just thought, how... Yeah how ultimately sad and this is preying upon people's you know believing in this higher power and becoming so close to yeah. some sort of spiritual understanding so it really takes you in but the yogi budget of it all was so uh fascinating to me because here's a man that you point out he came from india and people just assumed he was like into yeah. like yoga and spirituality and it was almost like this ultimate con, like people just expected yeah. that he knew these answers and he didn't necessarily. And if you follow Kundalini yoga, it's these repetitive movements that a lot of people are already a little suspect of. I mean, did this kind of blow you yeah. away when you started digging into him? I mean, yes and no. I think that it was almost, you know, it affirmed a lot of sort of what we know and see about society. I think that he landed in a time and a place that was looking for, they were looking for spiritual teachers in the sixties. You know, they were, there was a mistrust of government and institutions, a lot of what we see right now. And so there was an appetite to look to other cultures and other leaders. And I think his sense of otherness, his sense that he came from the East, that he looked different, that he sounded different, and that he was able to bring about these new practices um, really sort of like fit perfectly into that sense of longing. Um, and so was it surprising in an odd way? No, I think more than anything, it was sort of um, reaffirming of, of what we see and 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 can make sense of. It, it allowed us to sort of see and make sense of things. But one thing that you did mention earlier, which I think is, you know, you start laughing at something because there's a lot of absurdity in this. There yeah. is, there are so many sort of tones and that was both one of the challenges and really one of the opportunities and, and things that, that drew both Smiley and me to this story was that we wanted to attempt to hit all of those different notes with this, you know, to, to create room for sort of levity and play and humor where you can. E even, even all of the individuals who were a part of this community they they have a sense of humor about some of the absurdity of it, right? And I think you need to, you need those breaks. But that was absolutely a challenge and something we wanted to be mindful of is that we're going to hit, you know, these notes. And then we are also going to get into some really dark and heavy um, subject matter and, and real human lives and stories. And so how do we sort of honor both of those things at the same time? Yeah. Smiley, how do you go about choosing or going after these people to be able to interview with Talking Heads? Because you have this wide range of followers of uh, Guru Bhajan from the beginning. You have uh, the one daughter who blew me away with her very brave story, uh, you know, about the, the abuse. And then to go over and, and and you know, with Katie's, all of her followers, I mean, you really, there's not, it feels like a stone unturned in all of the people you talk to. How do you go about securing these interviews to tell this important story? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, we, we probably did hundreds of Zoom pre-interviews with so many people from, yeah, like you said, it's like, it's, the story spans uh, five or six decades. So there's people from all, all different walks of life that, you know, are attracted to this practice. And then there's the Rama crew, the Guru Jagat crew. It, it took a lot of yeah, just basically interviewing, pre-interviewing. Um, we would get connected to people through other subjects. And uh, it took a lot, you know, to get her parents on board, which was super important. Guru Jagat's parents on board, which was super important. Oh, which was so beautiful. I mean, I, if you didn't have, I mean, the mom, there is such an oh, honesty yeah. and, and the stepdad. I mean, such beautiful talking head footage of them. And especially at the end yeah. when, you know, what happens to Katie and them just trying to make sense of it. And the mom saying, I didn't, I didn't realize she needed help. Like, I know she wanted yeah. money and she wanted a loan, yeah. but it was just, I mean, it, the, the pain and suffering was, it was sort of beautiful yeah. in this docu-series. Yeah. Yeah. We wanted yeah. to make sure that yeah. Guru Jagat had her, you know, because she wasn't here to tell her story or say, say her side of it. We wanted to make sure we had people that were speaking to different parts of her, you know, and try to balance it. That's why we had Laura, her childhood best friend and her parents. So yeah, it was, it was a really long process to get um, people on board because, you know, it's 
really scary to sit on camera and be so vulnerable. So everyone that participated like blows me away how brave they are. And yeah, it's amazing. I mean, you were able to really humanize Katie, like, and that's why, you know, that's her actual yeah. name and not what she became. And I thought that was so interesting to think about that and how life can sometimes yeah. spiral out of control and the power dynamic and then introducing COVID. And you guys, I know if you haven't watched it, this is a lot of information, yeah. but there is a lot of information to digest <laughs> in this, which I think you are going to really truly love and appreciate this ride that you're about to go on with this docu-series. Um, yeah. What surprised you when you you went through the making of this were there any big surprises for you guys where you were like i can't believe we found this out i can't believe we discovered this yeah there's still surprises still every day i mean rama yeah. los angeles just closed its studio it's just it's never ending i think there is you know there there are sort of a number of elements to to this sort of answer this question which is one that this is like a a, a living breathing community and so it is a live story things are forever happening but um, I think, you know, to one of your earlier points about wanting to like humanize Katie, probably what was most surprising, and I think what really like changed the trajectory of the series and of the filmmaking process for us, um, was that Katie's parents handed over her laptop, her phone as a way for us to, you know, go through all of her photos and videos and materials and, and use that in our storytelling. And I think for us, that really sort of like cracked the window open. We were able to get a glimpse into um, Katie in her most intimate and personal and raw moments. And I think that was surprising in the best of ways. I think we, we wanted to humanize her. We wanted to understand her better than this Instagram caricature that we all see online, you know? And I think being able to see those selfie videos, live in those moments with her, that's when it sort of, that felt surprising to both me and Smiley. And we always joked around that we were like, we wish, we wish we could have hung out with Katie. Like she seemed like a great hang, you know? And I think that that, that made, at least, especially for us and, and the process of making it that made watching her evolution all the more tragic for us. And yeah. I think we really wanted to honor sort of that, um, honor the grief in that alone in, you know, in watching somebody change so drastically in a way that maybe wasn't in their best interest. Yeah. And I'll just add quickly, I think, and I don't want to give too much away because I don't want to give give away what happens. I don't know. Can we do that? Yeah, not... I don't know. That's what I was even wondering in the interview because it's such a, a part yeah, of the story. Yeah, I think story. we're trying not to. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. There, there's a lot. There's a big turn that happens in the fourth yeah. episode that I think but, really informs so much, but I don't want to give it yeah. away for people. But I, sure, but I yeah. will say that twist or, you know, whatever you'll call it, um, that happened in the process of, um, you know, we didn't oh. set out to, with this project. That wasn't um, a thing. That had not yet happened. Yeah. Happened. We, we, yeah. We basically yeah. were, we woke up one day and received that information and news. Um, and it was, that was probably the most shocking moment. Um, and it'll probably be a shocking <laughs> moment in the series for people as well too. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it really, it, it shocked me. And, you know, it's six, you know, the 60s was a different time, obviously. And, you know, people searching and searching, but we're always searching. And you guys like opened up this period of time that I re even remember, like that 2005 and like Golden Bridge Yoga. Yeah. And I, I mean, I live in Los yeah. Angeles. I went, I went to the same acting studio as Jules Hartley, who is in a talking head on this. Yeah. So I was like, oh my God, Jules. And I had no idea that she was a part of this. Yeah. But I remember yeah. there is this spirituality, especially if you take an acting class in Los Angeles, you know, there's all of these like, let's go see yeah. Ama or let's get these beads or let's go. And 100%. you want to believe in something bigger because the life of trying yeah. to be an actor is so brutal. But That's I just nice. remember this nice. period of time so well, because I was like, oh, yeah, I would have taken Katie's class. I probably would have been there 100%. 100%. And then that was one of the things, both taking Katie's class and just the like, the omnipresence of Kundalini, particularly in Los Angeles and in communities like this, yes, where people are seekers, you know, they're seeking um, self development and growth. And that is what makes this as a place so beautiful. And it makes it ripe for predatory behavior. But all of that to say, I think that, um, yeah, it's 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 really ripe here. And I think one of the things that when we were first sort of 
talking about this was, you know, you may not be familiar with Kundalini yoga, but chances are, if you've gone to a yoga studio, if you've taken a yoga class, you've done some Kundalini yoga. Yeah. It is, you know, it is incorporated into different practices. There are classes at dance studios. There are classes at yoga studios. There are, you know, the breath work, like you've probably touched it somewhere. You've probably had yogi tea. I think oh, that yeah. was one of the things that for us made this story so interesting, just like the the far reaching tentacles that it touches so many parts of life that you wouldn't even expect. Yeah, I mean, I always say actors are exposed to more inspirational phrases by the time they're the 30 than most people hear their entire lives. Like that's, it's just one of those things to keep you going on this process. But I always just think like how interesting that a lot of these things are so predatory because they are taking susceptible people that are looking for an answer yeah. But the 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 Katie story alone, yeah. like what really blew me away is the Guru, Guru Jagat stuff, who I wasn't really familiar with. This man met dignitaries, presidents, you know, they when he passed away, you know, he was given like national mourning and you realize how much money was flowing through his company. And at the same time, like any kind of, well, I hate to make generalizations, but with religious leaders, there's always that point where, I mean, you have this fascinating detail in this where this man, you know, promoting health was one of the unhealthiest people ever. His favorite food was Taco 100%. Bell. He, he did this thing that st stood with me that he would just take a bunch of leftovers and jam it up in a pot. Yeah. I still have not recovered from that detail. Like, yeah. I almost got nauseous thinking this was this no. man's wild uh, detail. <laughs> It's not great. It's not no. great. It's not yeah, great. we weren't well during that interview. I it was not great. We weren't well during that interview. We were like, oh, sorry, yeah. what? Um, yeah, I think one yeah, of the, that, the interesting things that I in the in the series too is that, um, like a, like Mahani for instance says like she's she never saw him do yoga or kundalini yeah. once in the twelve years of being mm -hmm. you know around him the her her, her whole life basically. So it's just wildly. A lot of, yeah, contradictions, qualities, and, yeah. And it's also funny, you'll see, you know, even in like some of the earliest clips of Guru Jagat, and this is her like likability and her charm. She like makes a joke of like, I'm going to sit up here and tell you guys to do these exercises while I sit on stage in my nightgown. And I remember like laughing hysterically. I'm like, she's funny. <laughs> and it's true. She's not doing the exercises. He's not doing the exercises. You know, and we just accept these as leaders. We we just are so willing to give that over yeah. to give our kind of power over to them very easily. And you see that I think time and time again in these stories. Um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the other thing, and obviously I want to give a big trigger warning on this, was that I was kind of like, you know, I don't know which episode this gets revealed, two or three, but there are, and and I was waiting for this, but I was like, oh, maybe this is just abuse of money and and people, but it does eventually with. Uh, go wow. to sexual abuse. And that was just the part where yeah. any kind of funny detail about this man went out the window for me, where, yeah. you know, you have, you have this, this, this woman uh, giving her testimony, this, and you mm -hmm. see what this has done to her, you know? And I just thought how brutal being summoned to this guru's room every night and be forced to do things to him or yeah. with other people. That was just this, I just, I couldn't believe, I mean, I could believe it, but I couldn't believe it. Yeah. That was probably the yeah. intense days um, of filming for us with Mahani and telling her story. And um, yeah, Haley conducted that interview and did such an amazing job talking her through it. And yeah, we were super honored to be able to have, tell, tell her story. It was yeah, really what intense. Yeah. I, Mahani, as a person is incredible. She is remarkable. And her willingness to share her story is equally remarkable, um, to be so vulnerable and so forthcoming and also understand sort of the reason why she is willing to come forward with all of this. Um, and I think that after, like Smiley said, after sort of conducting those interviews, it was really difficult for us to not sort of course correct the entire trajectory of the series. Um, you know, I think there was a big part of us that Mahani's story is so significant. You know, we wanted to give it as much time and space as we could. And yet we really had to sort of grapple with, we're ultimately telling this story through, through the lens of the Griggs and through the narrative of Katie become Guru Jagat and that evolution. And we had to find a way to um, 
to incorporate Mahani's story without letting it eclipse everything else. Um, I think, you know, that is also sort of one of the other fascinating elements of this is that the wrongdoings of Guru Jagat, the abuses of Guru Jagat pale in comparison to those of Yogi Bhajan. And that becomes, you know, exceptionally evident as you hear stories like that of Mahani, as sort of you see footage from boarding schools. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, unfortunately, Mahani is one of many people who had that yeah. experience. And I think what we saw and witnessed was that there was a real system in place for that. But almost, I mean, with, with Yogi Bhajan, he almost got the easy way out with death. He never really had to face any of this, you know, and, and I thought that was so interesting as well because he didn't realize, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the light that was going to be shined on the abuses. So he died yeah. a wealthy man in power that was celebrated by so many people, which also makes Katie's story that much more tragic for, you know, bearing a lot of the brunt. I did want to ask about Harry Jiwen. So the, the, yeah. it's such an interesting story. First off, I, uh, sorry, Mahani, I wanted to go back to just to point out to the audience. What's so wild yeah. is in the sixties, these followers, you guys, they would let them take their kids and send them to school in India, like away from their parents. And that's where Mahani had to go. And they were sometimes completely mistreated. You know, they weren't fed well, a lot of just obviously abuse. And I thought that's how strong strongly these parents believed in it that they were willing to give their kids to this to this this movement yeah that that was probably yeah on another just yeah wild thing to grapple with too is because um the way we came to the story was through a woman whose parents you know raised her in it too and so we always kind of had that in mind from the second generation you know how wild it would be to be raised like that yeah. Yeah. And and just the lack of agency. You know, these were children who were born into it. They didn't choose this. And I think that's one of the things that is really fascinating about the story, particularly when you look at like Yogi Bhajan and his early followers and then Guru Jagat and her followers. Both of those are people who came into this practice mm -hmm. at their own will. You know, they chose this. But the second generation, those kids who were born into it or brought into it, they had no say in the matter. And they inherited this community and they inherited everything that came with it and um i think that's something that so many of the people who we spoke to um really still struggle with to this day you know what do they make of that now yeah, yeah. i mean the 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 common denominator to bring it back to harry jiwen he was you know yogi bhajan's number two in a lot of ways and then went on to be Guru Jagat's, uh, I mean, number one or number two, where is Harry Jiwen today? Because I believe he's still alive. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. He yeah. is still so alive. Has he seen this? Um, he has not yet seen it. We did reach out um, and give him the opportunity to comment or participate in the series, but he declined. Um, and the latest we know is that he taught his last class at Rama Los Angeles on October 9th. Um, I believe he's heading to Europe, I want to say, for a Rama sort of retreat or teacher training. I'm not quite sure, um, but we don't know beyond that. So I think we'll, we, like everybody else, will have to sort of wait and see what unfolds. But you said at the beginning, Rama is now closed in Los Angeles. Is that correct? Yeah. Right. They uh, As of today, things are... Things are changing all the time, but as of today, they still have their Rama New York studio, their Rama Mallorca studio, and they have Rama TV, so their online streaming sort of platform and services. Um, but Los Angeles, which was really sort of the, you know, headquarters or flagship studio has closed. That's so interesting, and I would really uh, be so curious about Harry G. Wynn's, um just response to this, because I think it's, uh, yeah. and I would love to... Uh, understand his perspective and i also want to tell the audience if you haven't seen this yet another the one of the wild details in this of like th they were making their money with yogi tea and all of this stuff but they were also doing wild things like selling like toner to people like calling people and selling toner at inflated prices and then not even sending the toner like there was it was completely yeah. it was like glenn gary glenn ross of like just like hardcore right. selling that part also blew me away i'm like why do we need don't we have the yogi tea <laughs> money don't we have like why do we need the toner yeah. money that <laughs> that blew me away well yogi a very enter oh go ahead what was go that I, I, I was, was gonna, gonna say it's a very enterprise <laughs> 
Oh, oh, she froze up. It was an enterprise. Of, oh, you froze up, Haley. It was an enterprise of what? I was just going to say it was a very enterprising community, <laughs> whether it was legal or illegal um, or sort of at the corporate level with Yogi Tea or these smaller mom and pop shops. But yeah, really quite an entrepreneurial community um, at at no end. And I was going to say, uh, Yogi Bhajan said, there's no karma over the telephone. So that's what I was going to bring up. He's like, you're fine yeah. here when you're, when you're selling fake toner, your karma's good. <laughs> I thought that was such an interesting detail and something that they, they probably bought now, um, to take it back to Katie or yeah. uh, guru Jagat, um, uh, I did find it interesting is that once the pandemic hit, like a lot of us, she kind of, it really did a number on her mentally, spiritually. And like a lot of people, she really went down the conspiracy route and really was like, yeah. I mean, she was having people on saying like, Oh yeah, drink the ble bleach. It'll clean your blood. And, and yeah. all of this stuff, which I thought was another tragic part of this of like, when you yeah. are looked up to for spiritual guidance, and then your grasp on reality has completely been unmoored. I thought that was another part that I didn't necessarily mm -hmm. see coming. Yeah. 100%. And I think, yeah, I mean, it was a matter of who were the people she was surrounding herself with, right? And what was sort of the information and the communities that she was surrounded by and hearing a lot of, and that became normal. You know, um, her parents talk about, Nancy and Rabbit talk about, like, we, they didn't recognize who this person had become. And, and I think, you know, now, to one of your earlier points, Laura, her childhood best friend, says it really beautifully. Like, you know, when you go from being a seeker, you're looking for the answers, to then you're a teacher or a guru, you're supposed to know all of the answers. And I think that um, there is a sense of that sentiment in these conspiratorial communities and, and sort of um, I ideas or ideologies is we have the answers. You know, we know something that you don't know, and we have the answers. And I think that... Um, there already was that ethos in an elitist type practice and spirituality like Kundalini. And I think that um, it makes sense why perhaps conspiratorial beliefs and values found a, found a home there. Yeah. And I think I, I'll add to, so the, the book um, Premco white bird in a golden cage came out, which was kind of like breaking the floodgates open of, you know, what, Yogi Bhajan was actually doing and all of this stuff. And that happened um, like early 2020, I think. And so then we were all in lockdown and um, the Facebook group started for the survivors. And so I think it was kind of also a perfect storm of all of these things to come together while yeah. we were stuck in our houses and everyone started talking and that was kind of yeah. Yeah, opened the floodgates for everything to happen and come out about um uh, Yogi Bhajan and then Guru Jagat had the opportunity, you know, to com or had to comment on the, all of this stuff. And she, you know, went the opposite direction of what you, your typical feminist would do. Um, so I think that was also yeah, really interesting during the co during COVID and all that stuff. Yeah, no, it was it was very interesting. I also want to highlight, um, the, you know, you spoke with a lot of people that that worked closely with Guru Jagat, and you know them trying not escape, but them leaving. You really see how powerful the mind can be, and how it can sometimes work against you. Of yeah, like at yeah. any point they could have left, but they didn't because. You know, think about your spiritual being tied to this person. And if you left, you were putting so many things at risk. So for me, I completely understood why it was so hard to leave. Mm -hmm. And you have one of her uh, employees that, um, you know, she had, she got into an accident and she almost thinks God, she got into an accident yeah. because it like, you know, she had a concussion or something and it, it, it let her not um, kind of focus on the wrong yeah. things and be able to Step away. leave. Yeah, step away. And I thought that was also interesting just to hear those stories from them because that's a, a wild ride that they went on with Katie. Hundred percent. It's almost it almost like feels reminiscent of abusive relationships. Like it was like she needed that like shock to a system to see things for what they are and actually get out. But I think yeah, it's there. There were sort of a, a couple elements of the difficulty for people to leave. One's the logistical. I mean, this is people's livelihoods. This is their community. This is you know how they're paying their bills. I think there. Well, I mean, barely. She was she she barely paid that. anybody's yeah. bills. I mean, like one lady is like, I just want to be able to pay my. <laughs> rent and the rent was like insanely cheap and i thought Correct. wow you're giving years of your life away <laughs> yeah. to these to this person and this this cause and then what that does to you on the flip side after and you come out of that yeah you know um i was thinking 100%. about um, and the other 
sorry. Sorry, Haley. I was just going to say, yeah, the other element, and this is something I think we bumped into a lot, was um, there really was a, like, spiritual fear. People were scared of this sense of, like, black magic, um, dark powers, you know. Uh, we see it with sort of the the chants and practices that take place in, um, I believe it's episode three. But there was a real fear that um, people could use these kundalini sort of practices for bad. And if I leave, that will be used against me. Yeah, that was another part of it. There are so many details in this. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, There are so many really just fascinating details as you go through the series. Like, I mean, just there were so many just like lines that I had written down. Like, um, well, I, I, I started calling Yogi Bhajan like a spiritual puff daddy, you know, yeah. where I was like, this, this is wild yeah, to think yeah. about in yeah. that sense. Because, you know, listen, they wanted to call uh, Katie, you know, the spiritual Kim Kardashian. I mean, yeah. it goes all the way around and just how important celebrity yeah. is in in all of this as well of like, oh, yeah. Orlando Bloom took this class or back in the day, you know, Yogi Bhajan was sure. at Woodstock performing Kundalini Yoga. Sure. I just thought, you know, that importance of getting that message out, but it's not for the good. It's usually just seems like it's for more money and more power. Yeah. Yeah, and it's cyclical, you know, it becomes money, and then the money is not enough. So then it becomes power, and then it becomes control of our other, you know, human beings and individuals lives. It's actually funny when you mentioned Puff Daddy, I actually can't remember if we use this line in the series or not. But there's a line from the Vanity Fair audio interview with Katie Griggs, Guru Jagged at the time. And she says, she's like, you know, it's funny, Hari Jeevan, my spiritual teacher, talks about me using the name Guru Jagged. And he's like, it's like being like Puff Daddy. Like, it's like your rapper name. And I'm like, wow, the confluence of all of these, <laughs> of all oh. of these cultural happenings at once. Forgot about that. Oh, my <laughs> yeah. gosh. That's how, pr how prescient. But the other thing, too, about uh, Katie Guru Jagat, and I'll do a primer before the episode starts so I can just fill in and everybody yeah, sure. on their names and the, the code names. But the or their spiritual names, is that what was so interesting is that Katie said she was given Guru Jagat from Yogi mm -hmm. Bhajan. She was blessed with this name, which then later came out that that was completely a lie, that mm -hmm. they had never met. And Harry Jiwen was the actual man that she was working with. But I just thought, wow, it's another one of those things as Katie started off as, you know, wanting to do this, this, this thing and like getting involved in potentially the wrong person that felt like the right person at huh. the time and wanting to be bigger than herself, you know, because you focus on Katie's story in college and the tragedy that happened to her there. And I just thought mm -hmm. like how many, you know, she thinks she's making the right steps and she thinks she's saying the same, the, the right things, or even though it's a lie, it's yeah. getting her to the place that she needs to be with these people. And it's just tragedy yeah. after tragedy in this docu-series. Yeah. I mean, hearing that makes me think of sort of like the mythology, both around her and Yogi Bhajan. And I think that, you know, there was a, there was this like justification of mythology. Like Yogi Bhajan is somebody who kind of just created this story around himself and it really served him quite well. And I think that there was a sense within that community and, you know, it feels or it felt from what our sources and, and subjects told us, that there was a similar sentiment being, you know, shared with Guru Jagat from Harry Jeevan. You know, do this in 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 the in the effort of X or sort of in the spirit of Y. Um, take on the name or the moniker of Guru Jagat in order to do, and there's this justification that comes along with it. And um, yeah, there's a sort of real bending and elasticity of truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, re really, a real big elasticity of truth. Um, I, I, I have about nine minutes left, and I wanted to just ask Haley and Smiley, like, how do you guys work as co-directors? Like, how did we divvy things up? I mean, are you going to war over ideas through the creative <laughs> process? Like, how does this work wow. for for you guys putting this all together? Yeah, I mean, we're uh, we've worked together for about eight years now, just um, on yeah multiple projects and we are very complimentary in, in terms of our skills and what we like to do. So it actually works perfectly. Um, I focus more on uh, visuals and art direction and creative direction because I do creative direction and art direction for brands and fashion and, and stuff like that. And um, Haley is writing and producing and 
Yeah, Haley, do you want to talk? More? Interviewing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I focus more on sort of like story and characters and interviews and structure. Um, but we both obviously dip into both areas and complement each other. And I think, you know, given a project sort of of this size and scope, it, you know, I don't know that it would have been feasible for either one of us. <laughs> well, it's like, game of, it's like Game of Thrones. There's so many different yeah. little pieces yeah. that you have to piece together and really keep the audience going along. And I mean, yeah. to your credit, I was, I was kept engaged and in it the entire four parts. Um, but I was also curious, you said this story is still developing, like obviously the Rama yeah. of it all, but like, are we still getting new information coming in? And at what point do you ladies like walk away of like, gotta go to my next project. I can't, I mean, I, this is dark. I mean, yeah, we thought we had walked away and then the studio closed and we're like, oh, oh, yeah. oh, what do we have to change now? Yeah. Um, are we going to do a know, fifth episode of Breath of Fire? <laughs> I mean, honestly. I mean, we'll see. We'll see. But um I think it's like any it's like any story or piece of art like it's it's subjective how and when you finish it you know what I mean like these are these are continuums so you just choose where you put a punctuation mark and sort of what that what what that question or statement is that, that you're leaving with but um yeah I think after a certain point we were like all right it's time it's time to close this door <laughs> Yeah, there's, I mean, yeah, to this day still, yeah, there's lots of just ongoing things um, from the 3HO community that continue to unfold. They, um, the reparations program that they're um, doing. And so, yeah, there's, there's so much to keep up on. Um, we do our best. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> I, I just, it would be mind blowing to try to piece all of this together, which you guys did so, so wonderfully. Um, uh, what did you learn Um for you guys, did this change your worldview at all? Like doing a project like this, did it change you yeah. fundamentally at all? Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. It changed us <laughs> drastically, I think. Uh, I think it's, I mean, I think it's hard for me to take a yoga class. Uh, I think I am more um, skeptical or at least, uh, you know, a little bit more inquisitive about, about things I engage in and with. Um, and what about you? I was just going to say, I feel like nothing surprises me anymore. I'm like, yeah, oh, well, <laughs> turns yeah. out that's the world. Yeah. I mean, yeah. This, what happens in the world? And it's just, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, the amount of times that we yeah. just called each other freaking out over everything and going back to also how we like worked as directors, like we would not have been able to do this alone. Having someone else to like go through the insanity yeah. of things that we were learning every single day was so important and helpful. Um, but yeah, yeah I just nothing surprised me anymore, but also just really like um, everyone's bravery in our, in our yeah. stuff really was just, is so inspiring. And yeah, it just yeah. Like made me be like, wow, like we're, everyone is amazing. We can get through hard. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's what I, I was wondering, I you think, know, like the, the sense of hope that you yeah, can be left I, with on projects like for these. Sure, yeah. For sure. For sure. I do think particularly as things were unfolding and whether it was, you know, you watch these sort of domino effects happen and um, the memoir comes out and it sort of like cracks open the door and then opens up the faucet and then the floodgates are open and now others start to come forward with their stories. And it's not just an echo chamber. This does change things. It changes yeah. where money is going. It changes what organizations stay in place. I think even frankly, a lot of people, former, you know, members of this community, former participants in Kundalini Yoga are very pleased to see Rama Los Angeles clothing, closing. They're seeing a bit of sort of like justice or an end of a chapter and so i think to smiley's point yeah it perhaps the the hopeful thing i think there that there is value true genuine value in people being brave enough to come forward and share their stories you know there's such risk and such vulnerability but there's such such value and merit in that and to have been trusted and um able to be a tiny part in sharing those i think felt like a, a real honor and privilege for both of us um, uh, just f finally, or just kind of two parts. And are you able to divorce yourself enough from the work where you can be really proud of what you did here? 
of that, you know, like, wow, look at, look at what we did. Like, this is, we told this story. I mean, are you able to do that? Or is that like a a faux pas in the documentary world? I think there's moments, there's moments where we like have to watch and we're like, wait, like, this is, this is actually good. I would watch this. I would watch this. A hundred percent. Yeah. We were swimming in it and in all of the details for so long that, you know, I think for a long time, it was really hard to not watch it without just like seeing everything that you're working on. And, ah, should we change that? Should we change this? Um, But I think with like time and space, yeah, every now and then we're able to reflect and be like, wow, that's cool. But again, it's, you know, I think we helped make and shape something, but th- this isn't yeah. our story. You know what I mean? We sort we helped shepherd along and, and give a home and a space, but it ultimately is, you know, everybody else's story who participated in it. And what would you hope for the audience to take away from this? I know we commercialize like religious abuse and cults and all of yeah. that stuff. And I think that doesn't speak to the depth of the story that you've been able to tell here. What do you hope yeah. after watching this fourth episode that audiences are able to take away? I hope they can see a little bit of themselves in these stories. I think one of the things that we came into this really hoping that we would be able to do is as much as there is absurdity in this story, as much as it is a quintessential cult in ways, um, these people are really relatable um, humans (laughs) with really understandable desires and longings. And I think that so many of those we can all relate to. So, I think, you know, whether it's being able to see and relate to sort of the seeker in Katie or, you know, any of the other individuals who sought this out with the best of intentions, I would hope that people can um, see and approach that with compassion and also walk away with a little bit more, um, yeah, skepticism and and critical inquiry towards sort of what it is that they are consuming and participating in. Yeah. I mean, I just think it also shows like how belief, our belief is such power and we've really got to protect yeah. that and, you know, like just don't give it away. I mean, it's really, it's really this stunning and you guys just thank you for letting me talk to you today because I really was really kind of blown away by this. And I think the audience listening or watching will be as well. And I also want to tell you, I saw that you guys executive produced Meet Me in the Bathroom and Rise the Amber Comedy. I loved Meet Me in the Bathroom. I just thought, oh God, the LCD story. I love <laughs> I, I love that. And the Rise the Amber Comedy. We just had new Amber Comedy news today. Yeah. So that story okay. is still developing. Right. But thank you for your work. I can't wait no. to turn people on to this. And, and um, uh, do you guys have a new one that you're co-directing at all? Not co-directing. We're both working on lots of things. I think we will always continue to work together in various capacities, but um, we don't have a big beast that we are currently. Smiley's like, I'm done. Haley, Haley and me are done. This is this is the last this is the last (laughs) time. Well, hopefully, the fifth episode of Breath of Fire will be out eventually. But you guys, HBO, right now, go watch all four four parts of this docu series. I think you're going to love it. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thanks. 